Well, I think um, we've got a great crowd here so far. It's so nice to see folks and to see folks' names and to know that we are, um, we're together. Uh, no matter what pandemic or pestilence or tempests may arise, we are here. Um, so I think Bob is, is home today and um, is going to offer us a prelude. Good morning. Welcome to First in Summerfield United Methodist Church. I'm Shua, one of our co-lay -lead leaders of our church, and I hope you all are staying safe out there at home, and well, uh, we are glad to have you all at our worship today. Amen. Gosh, thank you so much, Bob, for that wonderful prelude, and Shua for your greeting. Um, she was going to be uh, with us less in, in the coming months because she's about to move to New York City and start um, her time as an NYU student. So we are just so uh, excited, excited for Shua and um, can't wait to hear about all your New York adventures. Um, and just thank you for your service as one of the lay leaders of our church for these few years. So thank you, thank you. We celebrate with you. We're giving some Zoom silent applause. Yay, Shua, we're rooting for you. <laughs> Amazing, well, it's so good to be here today to see, uh, see you all on with us, to see our community gather in, um, in spite of, you know, dire predictions and anxieties and preparations for this storm in addition to all the other things <laughs> that are going on in our lives and our communities. Um, we're just so grateful to be together and to know we're not alone. Um, let's take a moment as we do each week to just have a, a time of silent intention and to bring your whole selves into this space into this community and before God and to set our set our intentions for this time together. So let's take that moment of silence now. A 
and then Stephen's going to join with me in leading our call to worship now. Be strong. Be strong, not in weapons. Be strong in God. Strength, not in the power of harm. Strengthen in power of the divine. Our struggle not against enemies of blood and flesh. Our struggle against the rulers, against the authorities. Against the cosmic powers of these present shadows. Against white supremacy and abuse. Against systems of domination and heteropatriarchy and ableism. Be strong. Be strong in the power of all that is sacred. For we boldly proclaim that the power of good and justice and love will have the victory. Amen. Let's join in singing with Kelsey, who's leading us from home uh, in A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper God amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. Its craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not its equal did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing were not the right one on our side the one of god's own choosing Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and Christ must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed God's truth to triumph through us. The realm of shadows grim, we tremble not for them, their rage we can endure, for lo, their doom is sure. One little word shall fail them. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abiding. The spirit and the gifts are ours through God who with us sided. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. This kingdom is forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Let's join now in our prayer of confession. Would you join with me? Oh God, forgive us when we make enemies of blood and flesh. Forgive us when we fight against our own bodies, when we reduce and demonize other bodies. Forgive us when the cosmic powers, the systems of harm, the authorities of this world escape our accountability. Forgive us when we put our trust in the strength of militaries and fear. Transform us to put our trust in you, in all that is good and just and sacred. Let's take a moment of silent confession.
Beloveds, hear this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of Kimmy. Drew's now going to lead us in our scripture reading, which comes again from Ephesians. Uh, this is our last week on Ephesians. We're in chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that utterance may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am the ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Drew. Let's take a moment of prayer. Holy one, on this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh boy, well, there's been a lot of, uh, I think, uh, thoughts in our brains the last 24 hours about big storms, <laughs> about this one big storm. Um, I don't know about you, but I get really quite anxious about big storms. I think it comes from growing up in Tornado Alley in Missouri. Um, so I, I have lots of memories about tornadoes and tornado prep. Um, and I have these memories of these tornado drills that we used to do at school. I, I don't know if anybody else did tornado drills at school. <laughs> I see Alana and some other folks. Um, so we did tornado drills and we had to like go out in the hallway and we like roll up our bodies um, onto the ground right by the wall, the interior wall. And then we would put our hands over our heads like this and cover our heads. Um, that's what we did. That, that was our defense against the tornadoes. <laughs> so, you 
you know, in a way, it felt a little bit silly to do something like that. I mean, if an F5 tornado, you know, and all its natural fury really hit the school while we were there, I don't know if huddling together in the hallway, you know, protecting our heads with our little hands would really do anything. I'm sure it would do something. That's why we did the drills. Um, but I don't know. And, you know, even if it wouldn't save us from every tornado, um, I just feel like there was something comforting about having a physical thing to do, <laughs> you know, having some kind of physical protection, even if it seems like small, some physical protection around your body, whether it's like the interior wall or just your little child hands, um, these physical things can really make us feel safe and calm. I remember a few months ago when we blessed um, prayer shawls that folks had knit for people who were in crisis or having big transitions in their lives. Um, I remember at that time, some of you were sharing how, how just like loved and comforted you felt when you were wearing those like physical prayer shawls in the hospital or at home while you were recovering from, from something. I think a prayer shawl is like this physical reminder, physical element that we can place on ourselves to remember that we're not alone, that a community, you know, cared enough for you, thought enough about you and what you're going through to like bless a handmade shawl and get it to you. Um, and that that community that created this shawl that holds your body physically is also a community that believes in a power that is like greater than whatever powers are assaulting you right now. Now I've been thinking a lot about like these physical reminders and about power this week while I've been meditating on this quite famous, I think, um, passage from Ephesians 6 that Drew read for us today. This like this take up the whole armor of God imagery in which you know, the Christian is imagined as a spiritually equipped warrior. You know, as a Christian, you dress yourself by physically putting on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and shoes that make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And you take up the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Um, have you all, are you familiar with this passage? I don't know. Um, where I grew up, it was called Tornado Alley, but it was also called the Bible Belt. And this, at least where I was growing up, this was like a very popular um, scripture passage. And, and I think that some of us who came out of, you know, places like the Bible Belt or left more conservative form of Christianity might feel like a little bit uncomfortable with this passage um, because it has this like very Kind of violent war imagery, I guess, of, of the warrior. Um, this kind of fighting a war for God is, is a little unsettling as we, right now, you know, we're seeing religious fundament fundamentalists winning what they consider to be a holy war in Afghanistan, or, you know, as we grapple with our own Christian fundamentalism that raged across the world and continues to do so in many ways, like Christian warriors hand in hand with empire and indigenous genocide and white supremacy. So like having this image of the great religious warrior is on the one hand, a little bit uncomfortable. But as always, I think it's just so important for us to always remember that unlike many Christians today, the Christians who wrote the Bible had very little physical and political power. That's just so important to remember. So we get really messed up when we read the Bible and we forget this, this particular fact. We have to remember that most of the Bible was written by oppressed people who had more in common with Afghan families hiding today from the Taliban or with Haitians trying to survive crisis after crisis. You know, the Bible was written by oppressed people who had way more in common with oppressed people today than with those of us who watch the effects of war and poverty from the comfort of our homes. And when we forget that, we lose all the meaning of the, these sacred writings. 
So that is something that we always have to remember. And we get reminded of that in this passage in verse 20, when the author imagines the apostle Paul as an ambassador in chains. So Paul, who is the imagined author of this letter, is, is writing about this warrior image while he himself is in prison, wearing chains on his body every day. He's like sitting there physically powerless in a jail cell, watching the guards around him, Roman guards who are literally physically armed with like real life warrior stuff. They're protected by these metal breast plates and metal shields and metal helmets. You know, their swords are sharp and they draw blood and they take lives. They strike terror and anxiety into the people around them. They have all physical power over your life. They hold the keys to your chains. They, you can't even feed yourself or have a drink of water unless these soldiers allow it. So this is the kind of thing that Paul's looking at every day of his detention and incarceration. Um, you know, in a physical armor and sword fight, Paul has already lost. And we have got to ground this passage in a situation like that, not in our like com comfortable sitting in our houses, you know, watching the end of war on TV. Um, we have to ground ourselves in where these texts really came from. So in this physical war, you know, Paul's, Paul's lost. But the thing is that Paul knows that the physical fight is not all that there is. He knows that the greater battle in life, and this is what we, I think, believe as, as people of faith, the greater battle is a spiritual battle. You know, for us, it may be the struggle against systems of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, xenophobia, and despair. For Paul, it's, it's empire, war, oppression, literal chains. And, and while he might lose the physical fight today, he knows that in the spiritual war, in the fight against hopelessness and hate, he knows that that is a fight that he can fight. That's a fight that he can win. And he imagines his own strength and the strength of the communities that he's building. He imagines that strength with the images of strength he has around him, images of war and violent domination. And he subverts those images. He turns them upside down and he uses them against themselves. And he imagines not a physical armor, but a spiritual armor, not the power of, of the empire and domination, but the power of God, you know, surrounding the Christian, protecting them, not with metal, but with truth and with righteousness and with peace. So when I think about these images in this way, the images are not uncomfortable, they, they're comforting. It's, it's kind of like the prayer shawls and, and the child hands <laughs> protecting my head to imagine a power surrounding my body and, and making me feel just as protected and, and physically, just as protected as a physically armed warrior who seems to have so much power in this life. I was um, listening to a New York Times podcast this week about Afghanistan. I know a lot of us have just been uh, devastated watching everything that's been going on there. And in this podcast, that they had these recordings from one of the Times Afghan correspondents as um, the Taliban were taking control. She was making these recordings and sending them to the Times. And a lot of what she was talking about were just kind of her experiences trying to get her family to safety, trying to get out, you know, these kind of logistics and descriptions of what was happening. But then there was this one recording of the day that she realized that everything was falling so rapidly. And she just described hearing about each city, quote, collapsing. And how just every time she heard that a city had collapsed, it just broke her because she knew that what that really meant was that these real people's dreams and freedoms were collapsing. And she was just like weeping on this recording. 
And she said these heartbreaking words, and I just want to read them to you. She said, I feel so helpless and powerless because I can't do anything. She said, I wish I could do magic. I wish that this country would grow wings and just fly away from all this and just save her children. I don't know if I should fight, withdraw, or just expand my arms to just hold this country and its people and just protect them. I want to read those words again, partly because, you know, while good may have been done in Afghanistan, every mistake that the US has made in Afghanistan has been done in the name of our safety. And so I just want to dwell with this woman's words for a moment. I feel so helpless and powerless because I can't do anything. I wish I could do magic. I wish that this country would grow wings and just fly away from all this and just save her children. I don't know if I should fight, withdraw, or just expand my arms to just hold this country and its people and just protect them. These words, these like imaginings of, of physical protection and salvation in the face of overwhelming physical power are, I think, just like the most meaningful interpretation I have heard of today's scripture lesson. Just kind of asking, like, how do we imagine hope? How do we envision a struggle that we can win in the midst of such uneven power differentials? We are not in Afghanistan or, or in Haiti, but we are all you know, facing worldly struggles that we cannot win with worldly power. I mean, every one of us faces disease and mortality. We're all going to lose the battle against death, every one of us. And so what does it mean to, to feel safe in the face of certain defeat? You know, how do we find hope when we feel powerless? How do we feel strong when we're physically weaker than our adversaries? I put all these questions out there and then I don't want to leave you there. So um, I was thinking this week um, about, because of the, you know, the supposed end, I suppose, of, of the war of the United States and Afghanistan. I was thinking about Carl Paleo, who is one of our uh, saints of our church who passed away at the end of 2019. And even just like a few weeks before Carl died, he was still coming to our church every Monday at noon for First and Summerfield's Peace Vigil. If, if you are new to the church and you don't know, like this church's peace vigil, um, we used to have a peace vigil and it started when the US started the war in Afghanistan after 9-11. And members of this church decided that they wanted to meet every Monday on the church steps to pray for peace. And in the beginning, you know, there was a, a good core of folks meeting each week. There were lots of new pray for peace signs made for that gathering. People would walk by and, and even join in. Cars would honk and support. It was all this energy. Um, and due to many factors, you know, by 2019, 18 years later, um, those signs were pretty tattered. <laughs> Carl was one of the only regulars still out there on Mondays, alongside um, often Marion and Dean and this really sweet man named Joe. But some days it was just Carl. Um, and sometimes I think of Carl out there every week and, you know, I wonder about why he kept going all those years after the vigil kind of lost some steam. He's just this lonely witness to peace. I just think, you know, like what power did this lonely man sitting out on these church steps have against 
all of the complexities of Afghanistan and Iraq and the, the fears of the United States expressed through guns and armor, you know. I mean, you might say it was a little bit eccentric what he was doing, a little strange. But then I think, you know, what if Carl wasn't there? What if the people of New Haven were not reminded every Monday at noon that we were still at war? That our military, our, our so-called safety and interests were still affecting the safety and interests of families on the other side of the world? That we have transported our armor and our weapons into a place. And so we, we are now complicit in every life and every death that is touched by that armor and those weapons. You know, every Monday in the face of American militarism, Carl put on a belt of truth and put shoes on his feet to proclaim the gospel of peace. He, he did what he could as a war veteran himself to just remind those of us who could so easily forget about war that we still have a responsibility. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about meeting physical force, the physical force in his time of white supremacy with soul force. He wrote and he spoke about how nonviolence was not weakness, but it was strength. It took strength to resist evil with love and the power of the vision of a beloved community to bring so many people together that that kind of power could win victories no one could have ever imagined. We're all in certain struggles that we can't win. But I think what, what people like Carl asked is, is what struggles can we win? You know, what internal and spiritual and community resources do we have? What power and protection do we have? And you know, our community along with many others and three courageous families kept three undocumented neighbors home to parent their children in the face of an armed ICE enforcement force and, and deportation orders. That is power, that's power. Shawl makers in this church armed with knitting needles last year made sure staff and COVID patients at Middlesex Hospital knew that they were not alone in the face of COVID isolation and the very real possibilities of death. That's power. And each of us today, this week, you know, whatever comes in this storm and in future climate catastrophes that will come, you know, in the face of the terrors of the tempest itself, each of us has the power to check in on each other, to protect ourselves, our families, and one another, to share resources and to offer mutual aid to our neighbors. There may be, you know, battles in this life that we cannot win, but there are plenty of battles we can. There are plenty of ways that we can protect ourselves and one another against despair and hopelessness and undue suffering. And that I believe is just what we're gonna do. Amen. Let's sing now with Katie, um, O oh God of every nation. Shower destruction through the night. 
Katie. Now it's time for, here I am. Now it's time for us to join together in our shared community prayer. And I think now then it's perhaps time for all of us to take a deep breath and a moment of silent prayer. And let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the, the glory, glory forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Paul, for lifting up George. I, um, I didn't know about that. And um, George was a former district superintendent here in Connecticut and um, had first and summer field under his care at that time. Um, and that was when I was a student and I'm really going to miss George. Uh, well, I thank you for all of your prayers always and um, I give God thanks specifically this morning for all of our volunteers who helped to lead worship and the ways in which we've been able to switch things around this morning and all of you for being game for flexibility. Um, you all are just wonderful and awesome and thank you for being here for each other um, on this uh, anxious day. I, uh, I give thanks always for all of the resources and the gifts that uh, folks bring to this community through their time and talents and, re and financial resources. And you can always give gifts to the church through our website, fsumc.org, or mailing things to the church um, and, or, you know, just any other way you want to give <laughs> gifts. Um, we're so grateful, and at this time, we just dedicate all of these gifts to God's glory and service in our community and in the world.
Good. Well, let me uh, offer just a, really just one announcement right now for this week is that this Thursday, um, our church is going to be volunteering as a group for Downtown Evening Soup Kitchen um, starting at uh, four o'clock. And we would love to have uh, any of any of you join us for that. Um, Abby Langford is is organizing that, so uh, I'm going to put her email in the chat, and hope that you will be in touch with her if you would like to join us in volunteering on Thursday. I don't think there's anything else. Um, for us, just a reminder, just please look out for each other. If you know, if you have a personal relationship with people in the church, um, give them a call this week and make sure that they weathered the storm all right and um, look out for your neighbors this week. All right, well, we'll sing our closing hymn in just a moment, but first uh, hear this blessing. We may not have all of the worldly armor that we feel like we need to face the battles of our time. But we do have the power and the ability of God to protect one another, to care for those who are vulnerable, to do God's work in this world, in our communities, in the little ways in which we can. So find your particular armor, find your particular helmets of salvation on this day and go out into the world. Maybe not particularly right now, but go out into the world in this week and do the work of the sacred. Amen. Now let's join with Kelsey and singing Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, no. Hi, I'm Reverend Vicki Flippin, pastor at First and Summerfield United Methodist Church in New Haven, Connecticut, and we're so glad to have had you in worship today. We would love to stay in touch with you to know who you are and to let you know what we're doing in our community during this time. Um, so we invite you to send an email to fsumcworship at gmail.com, and we can't wait to hear from you. Have a wonderful week, stay safe, be blessed, and let's continue to participate in all that God is doing in the world. Bye.